SpaceX has finally set an official target date for Starship's 10th test flight. Alongside final launch preparations, the company has dropped the long-awaited Flight 9 investigation report, revealing hidden weaknesses in Starship's design that no one saw coming. Let's break it all down. Following a successful spin prime test that qualified Ship 37 for flight, the upper stage was removed from the launch mount and returned to the production site early Thursday morning. Inside Megabay 2, it is undergoing final inspections, including checks of its engines and other key components for flight readiness. The vehicle is also receiving missing heat shield tiles, and teams will soon load eight dummy Starlink satellites into its payload bay. These dummies act as mass simulators and test articles for the payload deployment mechanism, which will release them into a suborbital trajectory during the upper stage's coast phase. If successful, SpaceX can finally demonstrate Starship's readiness for operational Starlink V3 launches in future missions. Meanwhile, Ship 37's flight partner, Booster 16, is already flight ready and waiting at the rocket garden for rollout to the launch pad. At the launch site, teams are restoring the orbital launch mount to its original configuration. The ship test stand has been removed, all 20 hold down clamps have been reinstalled, and the propellant systems are being reverted from ship specific hardware back to the standard booster fueling setup. SpaceX initially targeted August 24th for the launch and began preparations accordingly. However, the scheduled road closure for that day was revoked on Sunday morning, signaling that more time is needed to ready the vehicles and pad for the test flight. Meanwhile, the FAA issued the Flight 10 launch license on August 15th, officially closing the Flight 9 investigation. The agency accepted SpaceX's findings and corrective actions, clearing the path forward. Understanding what went wrong with Flight 9 provides the context for both the root causes and the corrective steps SpaceX has now adopted. Let's break it down. Flight 9's launch began nominally, with liftoff, ascent, and stage separation all proceeding as planned. During descent, Booster 14 flew at a much higher angle of attack than usual, peaking at 17 degrees. This was intentional, to test aerodynamic limits and gather data for future aggressive trajectories. Higher angles of attack expose more of the booster's side profile to airflow, dramatically increasing aerodynamic drag and structural loads across the airframe. Approaching splashdown, it relit 12 of 13 planned engines for landing, but an energetic event occurred near the aft end when the booster was about one kilometer above the ocean, followed by telemetry loss. The investigation revealed that the higher angle of attack placed unexpected loads on the downcomer the large transfer tube that carries liquid methane through the oxygen tank to the engines. Under these stresses, the tube likely failed, allowing methane and oxygen to mix, resulting in rapid ignition and explosion. To prevent recurrence, SpaceX will limit the descent angles of Block 2 boosters, easing structural loads until the stronger Block 3 hardware is ready to fly. As a result, upcoming missions, Flights 10 and 11, will feature fewer experimental high-stress re-entry profiles. In the upper stage side, Ship 35 ignited all six Raptors after separation and climbed as expected. But three minutes in, sensors detected rising methane levels in the nose cone. By five minutes, the main fuel tank pressure dropped while the nose cone pressure spiked. Despite this, the engines continued running and the ship achieved orbital velocity and successful engine cutoff. This demonstrated that the stage had sufficient tank pressure margin to sustain engine performance, even while anomalous gas buildup occurred elsewhere. The issues stemmed from the ship's autogenous pressurization system, which routes hot methane and oxygen gases from the engines back into their respective tanks to maintain ullage pressure. This prevents cavitation at the turbopumps and ensures steady propellant flow to the engines. The failure was traced to the fuel diffuser canister mounted on the forward dome of the methane tank inside the nose cone volume. The diffuser's role is to spread methane gas evenly into the tank to avoid turbulence and uneven ullage pressures. During ascent, the diffuser cracked under unforeseen stress, allowing gaseous methane to leak into the nose cone payload bay volume instead of the tank. The autogenous system still maintains sufficient tank pressure for ascent, but pressure in the nose cone rapidly increased. In the coast phase, planned venting to normalize nose cone pressure created a strong reaction force, disturbing the ship's attitude. Venting at high pressure is effectively like firing a small thruster, producing torque that can destabilize spacecraft orientation. The automatic safety system halted venting to prevent further spin-up, but this resumed pressure buildup in the nose cone bay. 
the excess pressure jammed the payload bay door, preventing the dummy Starlink deployment test. As the ship continued its flight, reaction control thrusters gradually corrected the attitude, allowing propellant venting to resume. About 40 seconds later, however, additional liquid methane leaked into the nose cone through the breach, flash freezing sensors and controllers while disabling exposed electronics. The resulting system failures triggered automatic passivation, a built-in safety protocol that commands the vehicle to shut down and vent all propellant to space in order to eliminate any risk of explosion. Consequently, Starship skipped its planned in-space burn and entered a passive, non-operational state. It re-entered uncontrolled over the Indian Ocean, disintegrating at about 59 kilometers altitude and 46 minutes into the mission. Such uncontrolled re-entries, while destructive, are designed to occur safely over remote ocean regions, minimizing risk to people or infrastructure. As corrective action, SpaceX has redesigned the fuel diffuser to better direct pressurized gas into the main fuel tank while substantially reducing structural strain. The updated design features stronger materials, refined weld geometry, and a re-angled dispersion pattern to minimize stress concentrations. It then underwent a far more rigorous qualification campaign, where the hardware was cycled under flight-like loads for over 10 times its expected service life without sustaining any damage. With these fixes in place, SpaceX aims to ensure that the lessons of Flight 9 translate directly into safer, more resilient vehicles, laying the groundwork for upcoming flight tests and operational missions that Block 3 starships are ultimately meant to tackle. Flight 9 wasn't the only investigation recently closed. SpaceX also confirmed that the Ship 36 explosion at Massey's in June was caused by a COPV failure, as had been widely speculated. COPVs, or composite overwrapped pressure vessels, are small tanks storing high pressure gases for different systems. In this case, one of the COPVs inside the payload bay, which supplies gaseous nitrogen for the ship's environmental control system, sustained internal damage. That damage led to rupture, structural collapse, and ultimately propellant mixing and ignition. To address this, SpaceX has lowered COPV operating pressures, introduced stricter inspections, mandated proof tests before fueling, tightened acceptance criteria, and adopted new non-destructive evaluation methods to detect internal flaws. They've also added protective covers around COPVs as an extra safeguard. While Flight 10 nears, preparations for Flight 11 are already underway. Ship 38, designated for this mission, is currently inside Mega Bay 2, where it is receiving its Raptor engines. Once engine installation and other integration work are complete, the vehicle will roll to the launch pad for static fire testing. The booster for Flight 11 remains unannounced. It could be the new Booster 17 or the caught Booster 15 from Flight 8. Looking ahead, Ship 39, the first Block 3 upper stage, already has its nose cone in the Star Factory, where most of the heat tiles are installed and recently stacked onto the payload bay section. It will soon transfer to Mega Bay 2 for further stacking, officially beginning Block 3 ship integration. The nose cone also features upgraded catch points on both sides, far more robust than the test fittings used on Block 2 ships to date. Data gathered from those earlier flights on launch, ascent, and re-entry stresses enabled the redesign, resulting in improved alignment and load distribution that should enhance recovery reliability. SpaceX has unveiled visuals of its next-generation booster grid fins. These redesigned fins are 50% larger and significantly stronger than the current set. The larger surface area improves aerodynamic control authority during descent, reducing the need for excessive engine gimbal corrections. Block 3 boosters will carry three of these fins instead of four, yet still deliver improved vehicle control. The upgrade also allows the booster to descend at steeper angles of attack, giving the booster more flexibility in landing trajectories, even under adverse wind or weather conditions. They will also serve as lift and catch points, thanks to integrated catch structures. Current generation boosters feature separate catch points beneath the fins in Block 3. These are consolidated into the grid fins, streamlining the design. The fins will be mounted lower on the booster to align with the tower's catch arms and to reduce heating from Starship's engines during hot staging. Current booster fins experienced minor deformations from the intense thermal and mechanical stresses of stage separation, an issue the new design aims to eliminate. These hardware upgrades signal SpaceX's steady shift toward a fully reusable system with higher operational margins and fewer refurbishment steps between flights. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. 
On August 12th, spaceflight enthusiasts got a rare treat. Two of the world's most powerful rockets launched within minutes of each other, carrying high-stakes payloads for different corners of the globe. The day began with Ariane 6 carrying Medop SGA-1, a next-generation weather satellite, into orbit. This marked the rocket's third flight, another step in establishing Europe's next-generation launch system. About 64 minutes after liftoff, the upper stage deployed the payload into an 830-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit, inclined at roughly 98.7 degrees, concluding the mission. Medop SGA-1 is the first of the meteorological operational second-generation A-series satellites built by Airbus Defense and Space for the European Space Agency, equipped with advanced instruments to measure atmospheric composition, temperature, humidity, and cloud dynamics. It is central to Europe's meteorological program. Its Sentinel-5 spectrometer tracks trace gases like nitrogen dioxide, methane, and ozone, along with aerosols, vital for monitoring air quality, ozone depletion, and refining climate models. Data from METOP SGA-1 will feed directly into weather prediction systems, improving severe weather forecasts, disaster preparedness, and global climate monitoring, making it one of Europe's most significant scientific satellites of the decade. Only 19 minutes after Ariane 6 left Earth, ULA's Vulcan Centaur launched from Cape Canaveral on the USSF-106 mission, its third flight overall and first for the U.S. Space Force. The mission carried two spacecraft, only one of which was identified, the Navigation Technology Satellite 3, or NTS-3. Built by L3 Harris for the Air Force Research Laboratory, NTS-3 is an advanced experimental platform to test future navigation and timing technologies. Deployed into geostationary orbit at 36,000 kilometers, an unusual choice for a navigation satellite, NTS-3 will validate new technologies from a fixed vantage point. Its demonstrations include enhanced signal accuracy, ionospheric correction, and rapid adaptability to military and civilian needs, strengthening navigation and timing services that underpin everything from precision strike coordination to global telecommunications and scientific research. To counter threats like jamming and spoofing, it also tests new signal structures and software-defined radios. The launch carried a classified secondary payload as well, though the U.S. Space Force has withheld details. A reminder that while some advances are openly demonstrated, much of national security spaceflight remains hidden. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.